Cool, and I'm seeing people log on. Welcome to our guests who are signing on. We do have quite a few registered, so we'll hang out maybe for an extra minute or two um, and greet people as they arrive. I am at top of the hour, so the workshop, we will record it and we have closed captioning available. You can access that by clicking the live transcription button on the menu bar. Well, welcome to our friends who are just signing on. We're glad you're here. I do see quite a bit of movement with our participants. So let's wait for maybe one or two more minutes as people are joining and we will jump right in. We've got students, faculty, staff. We've got actually people from Anschutz and the system office signing on and even community members. So we're welcome to host you all. Yep, we're still logging on pretty strong here. So let's welcome everyone as they come. Me till two after. Welcome everyone, we're glad you're here. We'll get started in just a moment. For those of you just joining, we do plan on recording this workshop and closed captioning is available by clicking on the live transcription button in your menu bar. I've got two after the hour, so let's continue to welcome guests as they come. But I say let's jump right in and get started with this month's Let's See You Well. First, welcome everyone. Um, we've got a great mix of staff, students, faculty, community members. Specifically, we've got um, folks signing on from the CU Boulder community. We've got alumni, students, employees. We've got members of the larger CU system, folks from Anschutz, and even members from the local Boulder-based community and even national folks are signing on. So I am thrilled to be hosting this month's Let's See You Well presentation. I'm Erin Cunningham Ritter representing CU Boulder and the College of Arts and Sciences Be Well program. My partner, Marisha Lopez, is also here and pleased to announce that this presentation is a collaboration with the College of Arts and Sciences JEDI team. Um, like to thank you all for being here today. I would like to just share a little bit about the Let's See You Well speaker series, which allows arts and sciences researchers and practitioners to interpret the eight dimensions of wellness from their perspective, thus articulating the value of a liberal arts education through the lens of wellness and overall health, all while supporting a, a culture of care in the College of Arts and Sciences and of course beyond. Our experts are encouraged to articulate wellness through the lens of their research, scholarship and creative practice, while holistically showing the interrelatedness of health and wellness across our many life forms, including plants, animals, and human animals, and the environments which they reside, land, water, and air. Today, I am so thrilled to host the January Let's See You Well expert of the month, Mike Gill, Assistant Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and we're hosting his presentation titled Science and Coral Reefs and YouTube, Oh My, How Diversity Can Save the World. I'd like to share a little bit about Mike's background. He earned a BS from University of Texas at Austin and a PhD from University of Florida. He's broadly interested in the intersection of ecology, evolution, conservation, and animal behavior. 
He uses a combination of field experience, experiments and modeling to understand how individual decision making by wild animals can shape ecosystems and how these systems respond to human driven environmental change. Much of his empirical work has focused on spying on fish and coral reefs, which he refers to as Big Brother 1984 style, <laughs> to carefully measure, with the help of many cameras, how environmental inputs map onto behavioral outputs. His favorites to study species so far include roving herbivores, such as parrotfish, surgeonfish, rabbitfish, who are all especially interesting to probe because they perform the critical ecological function of controlling by eating algae, which can otherwise kill coral and degrade entire reef ecosystems. In addition to his traditional academic activities, such as research, teaching, and mentoring, he founded and directs SciAll.org, a mass science communication platform that uses vlogging to humanize scientists, demystify the process of scientific discovery, and make STEM careers accessible to all. We've got his websites listed. Uh, you could check out SciAll.org and also MikeGill.com. Um, so I am thrilled to host Mike Gill and his presentation titled, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Science and Coral Reefs and YouTube, Oh My, How Diversity Can Save the World. Let's, before he kicks it off, let's give him a warm welcome, Dr. Gill. I'm so glad to have you here and you can take it away. There we go, I'm gonna stop. Awesome, thanks so much, Aaron, for the generous introduction. Let me share my PowerPoints. <clears throat> um, does everybody see the PowerPoint? Great, let me just, huh, that's, sorry. That's static for some reason, let me check this. Murphy's Law of uh, Zoom presentations, I guess, right? This should work. Um, okay. This is a little bizarre. I haven't had this happen before where it does a presenter view, so I can't see if... Oh, here we go. Okay. Can you guys see a full presentation now? Okay. Fingers crossed that this holds up. Um, thanks again to Aaron. Uh, I don't. Uh, I I have a lot to share, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, thank you all for coming. First, um, second, I would like to start this presentation with an admission, which is that for the past ten plus years of my life, I have been able to lead an incredibly exciting and fulfilling existence, um, which is centered on traveling to faraway places and doing scientific research to try to understand how precious natural ecosystems work. Uh, most often for me, coral reefs. And um, the adventures that I've gotten to have, which you're seeing some video clips from right now, uh, have been just, they've changed my life uh, in incredible ways. And I feel incredibly lucky to have found this path as a professional research scientist. Um, but the truth is that if you would have told childhood Mike that he would one day be a scientist, he would have been likely disappointed and probably shocked, to be completely honest with you. Uh, and that's because I hail from a small oil town outside of Houston, Texas. And I'm the son of an immigrant from Argentina, and I was raised working class by a single mom. And I went to public schools where we were really taught to regurgitate answers to do well on multiple choice standardized tests. And so I actually thought I hated science. Um, science was one of my least favorite subjects. I thought it was really boring. It was a bunch of unrelatable facts collected by people of privilege that I couldn't relate to. Um, so didn't really care about science per se, but I was completely gaga for wildlife. And I was in sort of a suburb. I didn't really get into nature much, but I loved watching National Geographic and Discovery Channel 
documentaries, as you can see here, even even seeing some, you know, like fairly casual animal behavior on uh, in these documentaries is really exciting for me. But even at a very early age, it was clear to me that these animals that I loved to observe on TV mostly were uh, being threatened and they were being threatened by human activities. And this was incredibly upsetting. And I remember very vividly um, when I was a kid, I had this lofty goal of somehow one day being instrumental in the fight to save the world's endangered species and endangered places. But I was pretty clueless about how exactly I would pull off so lofty a goal. I remember I was around, around age eight. I told my mom I wanted to do that. Um, but you know, I didn't really have to face the music about what I was going to do with my life until I was going to graduate college and my family didn't have money for college. So my mom told me that she read that read, or I guess her at that point, that you needed to pick a major if you were going to get scholarships in college. So she she was a, a secretary and she printed off like a hundreds of pages, like I think broke all of her office protocols to print all these pages of a course catalog from the University of Texas at Austin, which was the flagship university in my state. She brought it home and she was like, pick a major, and which was a daunting task, but I did spend a lot of time thinking about it and reading through those majors. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was going to be an explorer, an adventurer, um, for the National Geographic Society. I was going to write stories and take photos of faraway places and faraway wildlife to try to inspire the general public to care about these things that I cared about. So this was inspirational enough for me uh, when I graduated high school. This is a 17-year-old, very unsure version of myself, um, to get a uh, full scholarship to attend the University of Texas at Austin the following fall. So um, this was super exciting. So I entered University of Texas as a journalism major with the intention of working for National Geographic. Uh, but that's when I sort of had an existential crisis. And, you know, it was, I'm a first generation college. Uh, I was a first generation college student. I came from no um, culture of higher education. And so it was kind of culture shock to begin with to be on a university campus, but it was all the more shocking when I sort of realized that I came up with this whole journalism idea kind of whimsically. It was sort of impulsive, and it was clear to me in my journalism classes, which, by the way, I think journalism is a phenomenal profession, but it was clear to me that it wasn't what I wanted to do. And so my first, my first semester, I had this sort of personal crisis where I felt like I just lied to all these, you know, scholarship review committees and... Um, you know, made them think I really knew what I wanted to do. And in fact, I don't think I really want to do this. And I feel pretty darn lost. Um, and so it was around this time that, oops, that I came across a flyer on the university campus to study abroad, studying coral reef ecology, at a place called Lizard Island, Australia. Uh, I didn't know what ecology was, but I knew coral reefs were cool and I'd never been in one. And I thought I always wanted to go there. Uh, you know, in, in swim around in a coral reef. And Lizard Island sounds amazing. It sounds like one of these faraway adventurous places that I would watch documentaries about. So I was like, this just feels right, even though this is for science majors. But I applied anyway, and I was very lucky uh, to get a scholarship to, to participate in this program, which unfortunately, I thought at the time, required me to take a bunch of science prerequisites, which I was not at all thrilled about. Again, I thought I hated science. Um, but it also meant that I got to spend my summer of my freshman year living and working here. This is Lizard Island in the background in the Northern Great Barrier Reef. It's a largely uncultivated island in one of the more pristine, accessible coral reefs in the world. Um, and at the time, it was in incredible condition. So I spent my summer there. And it rocked my world. I mean, that's the easiest way to put it. Um, these are the kinds of things I was seeing. These are photos I've since taken, but I was enveloped by an unbelievable diversity of wildlife and, you know, just creatures of all sizes and shapes and colors and levels of charisma that just, uh, you can't do, you can't do anything but be inspired when you're in this kind of ecosystem. And so this was really cool, right? I'd never been in a coral reef before, but this is actually not the part that rocked my world um, to my core. What rocked my world to my core was that as I was coming up with questions about this 
incredible alien like ecosystem I'd never been in before. There was a time honored, objective, rigorous process I could follow to answer my questions, whatever questions I could come up with. And some of those questions we don't know the answers to. We didn't know the answers to then. We still don't know the answers to. So I discovered what scientific discovery actually was, the process of asking questions, being creative, pursuing your interests, and learning new insights that don't, don't just scratch your own curiosity, but can help inform our collective understanding of the natural world. So this blew me away, major inflection point in my life. And so uh, I sort of went back to this child, uh, you know, child child uh, state of wondering what I'm going to do. And I thought, this is it. Like, I, I found my aha moment. I am going to be a scientific, uh, I'm going to be a research scientist. And I'm going to use science to understand natural ecosystems, um, hopefully coral reefs, I was thinking at the time, uh, to better understand uh, how we can preserve these systems and support the incredible diversity of wildlife that uh, that these ecosystems support. Um, and that was really an exciting thing. And it was also true that as I took that journey, so I went back to the University of Texas, I changed my major to, the, uh, to marine biology, and I haven't really looked back. And I'll tell you that the motivations have only grown, like I remain this kind of, you know, nature loving person, but it's also true that coral reefs, they support entire regions of people. They support the health, the lives, the livelihoods of entire regions of people in the tropics. And so there's just so much um, incentive to put a lot of energy into trying to understand these ecosystems, um, again, so we can manage them better. And so this is really what my research program centers on at the University of Colorado Boulder. And in particular, uh, as Aaron mentioned in the introduction, I tend to spy on fish a whole lot. Um, these are some of the fish that I, I like to spy on. And these are particularly important fish because it's their job in the coral reef to eat what we call benthic algae, algae that grows on the seafloor. Because if that algae doesn't get eaten, it can take over the reef. It can kill coral and degrade entire coral reef ecosystems. And all of the services that we get from those systems like fisheries that feed people, storm surge protection that protect entire coastlines. And so these are extremely important fish species. And so the scientific community, especially folks interested in conservation like myself, have really been trying to understand what makes them tick. Uh, and for me, what I love to do is go out and video record their behavior. And one of the things that I noticed early on in this type of work is that these individuals tend to form these diverse mixed species groups when they're out doing their job, this really critical job of, of removing algae from the reef. And it's true that when they're out in open areas of the reef, uh, making these uh, sort of ephemeral groups, they're also contending with big scary predators like this reef shark. And this is not at all an uncommon thing especially in areas of the reef where there's not a lot of shelter. There's a lot of exposure to big, scary predators, uh, even predators I've learned that can be scary to research scientists that uh, discover that their camera was almost eaten by that predator. So hopefully you can appreciate that for these reef fish that are super important, they're contending with this need to, to fill their bellies. They're hungry, just like we are, um, but also to not get eaten but they're forming these diverse mixed species groups. And I wanted to understand why. So I, I do experiments to try to probe this. And one of the experiments that my colleagues and I did early on was we exposed these fish to simulated predatory threats. And we did this repeatedly over and over again to see how does the uh, abundance and composition of that group of fish affect their collective response to danger? Do they respond differently? when they're surrounded by neighbors, for example. That's sort of the, the question. And so to ask this kind of question, you really need a highly standardized predatory threat stimulus. And it doesn't take much poking around the neuroscience literature to discover what's called a looming stimulus, which is simply an object that expands non-linearly, mimicking what it looks like for, uh, rather it's a shape, um, mimicking what it looks like for an object to come right at you. So this is what it looks like exactly. 
This is a looming stimulus. So um, shape expanding nonlinearly looks like it's coming at you, right? No one had ever shown this to coral reef fish in the wild, as far as we have found, but we decided we should give it a try because we know this worked in the lab for tons of different kinds of species. So we tried it in a coral reef, and to our pleasant surprise, it in fact does cause uh, many individuals to flee. And it causes a flight responses that can be particularly pronounced in some individuals. By the way, if you don't know parrotfish, that puff of sand is defecation, just to give you a sense for the level of fear that these individuals might be experiencing. So this was really cool. We had this threat stimulus, which seems to be working. It's highly controllable. We can present this to individuals uh, across social contexts, so to speak, and learn what that sociality might mean. But to really do this justice, we needed to be able to see everything from above so we could see what the fish are seeing. And so to do this, my colleagues and I did something pretty unusual. We built this jungle gym-like structure of video cameras where you have a series of cameras all pointed at the seafloor and you can stitch them together and you can look at tens of square meters in space simultaneously and watch everything that happens in that area. So as you do things like present an experimental stimulus, you can then track exactly where fish are going, which is really cool. Um, so you can measure very precisely what, what are these fish actually doing in response to our stimulus. But maybe even more exciting is that we can also measure exactly what they're seeing. So we can use uh, what's called a ray casting algorithm, which was originally conceived in video games, like first person shooter video games where, you know, you're a, 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 an agent in the system and you're moving around and you have a field of view. That's where this comes from. So we borrowed that and we used a ray casting algorithm to measure precisely in radians the size of every object in each fish's field of view. And we can then relate that, that um, those as predictor variables to whether or not those individuals fled from the threat stimulus. So let me just show you what this looks like in video form. So what I'm about to show you looks very similar to this diagram. Uh, it's the looming stimulus, which is presented on an iPad underwater. Um, that's showing up in the field of view in red. You'll notice it gets bigger because the looming stimulus, of course, is expanding. And neighboring fish, just like here, are showing up in gray. And this is this is going to be the visual map for just one individual. You can see it here. So it's that green dot in the beginning. That's This is a zanclid fish. And you can see we can measure every single thing it sees in real time, uh, you know, continuous time, rather. I'll show you that one more time. Um, so you can see the green dot is the focal fish and all the surrounding fish. Uh, you can measure, again, how big are those fish in the field of view of our focal fish. And so what we can do is do this over and over and over again. And so we did that. We had well over uh, 50 trials. We did this ray casting to over 600 fish in our experimental trials. And then we fit a simple mathematical model to the fish decision-making, which is to flee or not to flee, to see, can we actually predict this? And the answer is, we can. So we found this, uh, I'm not gonna go through the like rigorously what the math is here, but I'll explain what it means in just a second. But this is a decision function at the bottom. This is to flee or not to flee. And what we found is that by taking this visual, this incredibly rich visual information from the fish, from our videos, uh, in uh, into account as predictor variables, we were able to predict between 89 and 98%, uh, at 89 to 98% accuracy, whether an individual is going to flee or not flee. And so it just, uh, we were really blown away. That's something, a mathematical expression so simple to do this. And what does this expression tell us? Well, what it tells us is that first, reef fish like us depend on their social networks. In this case, they are far less likely to flee from a threat stimulus when they could see more fish body in the same visual hemisphere where they saw the stimulus. So in this little diagram in the right side, if they see more fish, if N1 and N2, if that amount of fish body they're seeing is larger, they're far less likely to flee. This is sort of this concept of, you don't have to worry about the bear chasing you if you're the fastest individual, right? If you're with, with, if you're with a group of individuals. So this, this kind of idea that um, these fish can actually hang out and continue to feed and fill their bellies, which is extremely important for their survival and their reproduction, um, if they have more fish between themselves and the threat. So that was pretty exciting. So fish social networks really matter, it, it appears. 
But it's also true that species also matter. We see that different families of these fish, again, these are mixed species um, social networks. We see that different, different families reacted differently. Some were uh, much more reactive to the threat stimulus. And perhaps this is indicative of them being like sentinel species, being able to, to seek uh, uh, to identify shared threats and alert the greater group. Because of course, when an individual flees, any other uh, fish within that local environment can perceive that too and um, potentially flee themselves. So the take home here is fish social networks seem to really matter and help these individuals navigate an unforgiving natural landscape. But the actual identities of the species within those networks, the diversity of that network seems to also matter. Uh, we discovered something else that gives more credence to that idea that uh, diversity really matters in that we found that certain fish species like this parrotfish right here can serve as safe habitat beacons and appear to dramatically affect the behavior of surrounding fish. For example, this rabbit fish species is kind of like the most pitiful fish you'll see in the reefs of Thailand. Uh, they're very abundant, but they are very timid and they're kind of scared of everything. And so when you see them, when they're not with this parrotfish, their bite rate is quite suppressed, it's quite low. However, when they get near these parrotfish uh, species, they exhibit this dramatic change in their foraging state and have this almost like werewolf-like transition to these like aggressive feeders. So they're able to kind of fill their bellies uh, much better than they otherwise can. And so it looks like um, this species could in fact uh, serve as what we call a keystone informant. Keystone meaning has a disproportionately important role and informant meaning it can inform surrounding fish species of safe feeding opportunities and help those fish do their job again of cleaning the reef. So this is all really cool from a animal behavior perspective. You know, it looks like fish behavior really gets affected by their networks and the diversity of, the, of those networks matter. But what does it mean as we scale up when we go from this sort of individual tracking and experiments, we you know derive the decision making rules through statistics, and then we kind of zoom out. What happens when we zoom out all the way to the ecosystem? Like, what does this actually mean? Does it matter? Do fish social networks actually matter? So we can actually do this. We can use mathematics to um, simulate coral reef ecosystems. We can use very simple mathematical representations of coral reefs like this. I'm not going to go through the math here, but the thing to note is that the social information that is shared within fish networks, these social networks, that component is in blue. And we're modeling the herbivorous fish community in the top row, the algae they eat in the second row, and the corals that those algae can compete with in the bottom row. And so including this social information component had never been done before. And so my colleagues and I built this math model based off of our findings that fish help each other find safe areas and fill their bellies quicker. That sort of simple observation, when you include it into a ecosystem model, what you find is that when ecosystems, uh, when coral reef ecosystems are subjected to threats like overfishing, which is a common problem in coral reefs around the planet, we find that sociality of these fish and their um, reliance on one another for important information, it causes the fish population to become hypersensitive to change, to environmental change. And this happens because as we remove large amounts of fish, you know, through overfishing, for example, as we reduce fish abundance, you reduce the benefits of the social network because the density of fish in the landscape goes down. So the number of informants can go down, right? And as the number of informants goes down, each individual can fill their bellies less. So you have a reduction in survivorship and reproduction, which causes fish abundance to go down and so on. So you have what's called a positive feedback loop. And this can cause the fish population to collapse under human-driven environmental changes like overfishing at far lower levels of disturbance than we previously predicted. But it's also true that, of course, because these fish eat algae that, that uh, can degrade entire coral reef ecosystems, when the fish population collapses, so does the coral population. And so you see the ecosystem as a whole appears to become hypersensitive when we include 
these experimental findings that fish are in fact embedded within social networks that are that are very important to their behavior. And this means that ecosystems like uh, like this can turn into ecosystems like this, which results again in a loss of services like food, like storm surge protection, like uh, entire economies based on ecotourism. By the way, it's it's estimated that one billion people across the world depend in, on coral reefs in some way for their lives uh, or livelihoods. So the stakes are very high. And what we're discovering is that fish social networks may actually be key to our understanding of these ecosystems and our ability to um, uh, effectively manage them. So my team and I are going to dig deeper and deeper into this line of questioning. And we're using lots of really exciting new approaches, including mobile multi-camera systems that will allow, allow us to track incredibly difficult to study large aggregations of herbivorous reef fishes. We can couple this with stereo camera systems. This is a, a, an example of this in Curacao that I set up last year, which we can put out in arrays. It's kind of difficult to see this, but there are actually six of these monopod structures that allow us to watch uh, hundreds of square meters of coral reef all at once. So before I was telling you it was tens, we're now into the hundreds. So we can look at how individuals move across these heterogeneous natural landscapes, which we can actually now generate entire um, landscape level maps of by taking photos. So these are, this is us dragging, it's like a scanner. We're floating cameras above a coral reef, they're taking photos. You can stitch those together and you can get the three-dimensional structure of the reef at entire landscape scales, which allows us to then do things like take our tracked fish, which we're using artificial intelligence to help us do this, and take these kinds of two-dimensional tracking instances like you see here, and uh, turn them into three-dimensional trajectories mapped atop a three-dimensional coral reef model. So the whole idea is back to, you know, like Aaron said, big brother, we can understand everything that these individuals are doing and measure with unprecedented precision the precise bits of visual information they're taking in as they are moving around and behaving within this heterogeneous landscape. So uh, incredibly excited to keep this work going. It's also true that I'm very privileged at the University of Colorado Boulder to incorporate this research directly into my teaching. Um, so I have the, the honor to uh, teach a field course, um, which I've actually been teaching for, for over a decade. I'll be teaching it in the spring semesters, starting this semester, actually, at CU Boulder. Um, and this is where you, uh, I, <laughs> take a, a group of undergraduate students that are really interested in science, and many of them want to become scientists, many of them want to become marine biologists, and we get out into the field, we, we get we get dirty, and we get data, and we design field experiments together, and this is an opportunity for these students to really um, play the game, in many cases for the first time. You know, they, they've read about the history of science uh, in so many classes up to this point, and you know, most of my students uh, when I take them into the field, it's their first research experience. And um, I, I really love taking students out that don't have a background in um, or don't have a personal connection to STEM like myself. This is my attempt to sort of create an inflection point like I had when I was able to take a field course. And so it's incredibly immersive and um, it's quite challenging. But before I use any more adjectives to describe it, I have a short clip from some of my students that describes what it is like to uh, be a marine biologist for three weeks in the field for the first time. Intense, busy, complicated, hard, challenging. I would just like to say the same thing. Exhausting, tiring, it's interesting, but it's hard. Tedious. Unpredictable? Unpredictable. Variable, I guess you never know really what's going to happen. Late, late nights, late <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's fun. Fun. It's fun. Challenging. But rewarding. Rewarding. Inspiring. Yeah. Worthwhile. Exciting. 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 Significant results after running stats tests <laughs> is super exciting. Anytime you go out, you find something brand new. You see a different behavior. You see a different fish. You everything. Everything's new every single time. This is like my first time, so it's like I like coming into the 
course like i didn't even know like what a transect was i didn't even know like a lot of what a lot of things were and so like doing this just, i don't know now i know a lot more <laughs> about it all this stuff that we kind of like already researched and read about it's just kind of like come to life well one thing i guess to like be reading about like the like topics that you're interested in but then actually going out and doing the work and like doing it yourself and really seeing everything it's just really awesome this feels like a job but a really a really cool job so um I, i'm sure you can appreciate from those testimonials this is a challenging but formative experience for students um even those who ultimately decide uh, that they don't want to pursue a, a career in, in STEM. Um, and for those who do want to pursue a career in STEM and, and decide by the end of the class, that's still, still what they want to do. This is in many cases, the, um, it's, it's the formative moment that allows them to understand, you know, what, what this can actually look like for them. So many of my alum uh, alums, um, uh, go on to graduate school. I have several now that are finishing their PhDs. Um, so it, it's really uh, a privilege to teach a class like this. Uh, and as I mentioned, I've been able to, I've been able to do it for for a decade. I, I started at CU as faculty this last fall, so it's it's going to be a new thing at CU. But I had taught at the University of Texas at Austin and University of Florida. And while I I feel very lucky to have this opportunity, I couldn't help but feel very early on in my um, sort of sphere of activities of research and teaching that there are so many people out there that are not fortunate enough to end up at a flagship research university like the university of colorado boulder for example um and i i'm so troubled by that like that's just it's it's remains something that is incredibly troubling to me and uh early on in sort of teaching these classes and getting to sort of be be the eight the uh catalyst for these personal inflection points of these students, it just got me thinking, you know, I'm, I'm missing, I'm missing a component of my career that's going to allow me to do this for more people. Um, you know, being able to do this for 15, 20 students at a time in these classes, fantastic, but that's just not enough. Um, and so I felt I kind of, you can see here, I'm, I'm back to that sort of child like state of what do I want to, like, what's my purpose? And it, and it is still science. Absolutely. Um, because science is incredible. STEM is incredible. Like just look around you wherever you are. You can attribute probably every object you see around you to STEM in some way. It has created our existence. Um, but the truth is that STEM is incredibly weak and ineffective without the public. The public is an integral component to the process of scientific discovery and bringing discoveries uh, uh, into um, the public sphere where they can benefit humankind. Right? Why, why else are we doing this, right? And so this is an important combination, the public and STEM. But what we're finding, perhaps this is clearer now more than ever um, with a global pandemic that continues to rage on, uh, and um, the fact that the world tends to be sort of divided on whether scientific research about how to deal with that pandemic ought to be considered and listened to. Um, and you could say the same about global climate change. Um, so there is this war on science. Um, I, I would say the, the unjustified and I would say even a moral um, politicization of the, of the public utility that science is. And simultaneously, there's an incredible lack of diversity in STEM. Um, it, it is still a the few, the privileged kind of situation. And some folks will make their ways through the cracks, like myself, that maybe have a very unusual background. Um, but there's just not enough uh, people like that that are getting through when we know just how much of an asset diversity can be to creativity. And since creativity is the driving force behind science, how many discoveries are we not going to get because we have a, a, a we lack inclusivity in our STEM workforce? So these are the kinds of things that I had been I've been thinking about for a long time, um, but it really started to come to a head for me in 2015 um, when I started to to think about how I could operationalize my concerns on this front through rigorous outreach efforts. 
And that came in the form of a mass science communication campaign where I was going to leverage YouTube, which was kind of the, the social media video game in, in town at the time, 2015. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm going to try to be cryptic about science. I don't want to turn off people like I used to be that think science sucks. So I'll be cryptic about it, but I'll show people the exhilarating personal journey that science is and has been for me. And I'll make videos on YouTube and I'll see what happens. Maybe this will make people change their mental image of what STEM is and better yet, maybe it'll make people feel like they have some kind of connection to this um, this entire career field, which they don't necessarily even have to participate in, but having a connection to it can allow them to see themselves in that and, and um, just uh, become scientific literate individuals and, and, and appreciate this utility that frankly their tax dollars are paying for anyway. So um, I gave this a shot and uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> the question was, can this work? That was sort of the first, first uh, take of this. So I made these videos, Confessions of a Marine Biologist, where I would kind of talk about adventures and misadventures being a marine biologist and really try to use storytelling as a conduit to get people to be exposed to the scientific process. Um, and, and similarly, I would do uh, li live, real time, I would record expeditions to places like the Gulf of Thailand, um, where we'd have crazy things happen, like storms destroying an experiment and um, wildlife encounters and stuff like that. And so again, storytelling. So let me give you an example. This was an experiment uh, I did looking at the effects of a snail's mucus, which you can't really see the snail, it's in the background. It casts mucus on corals. This is an experimental coral you're seeing in the foreground. And I went and I did this experiment. I had a time-lapse camera taking pictures of the coral so I could look at mucus coverage on the coral tissues. And I came back with my undergraduate research assistant and the camera was gone. And we poked around a little bit and discovered that there was a gigantic octopus that had taken the camera and brought it into its lair. As you see here, the camera kept rolling. So you get to see what it's like to be an octopus in its cave. Uh, and we found the octopus and eventually were able to tug of war, took two of us to tug of war this thing out of the tentacle of the octopus. So this is one of many, many real stories in which I can share something I think is objectively exciting. There is true adventure and it can come in the form of scientific research, but also share the motivations, the procedures, the anticipated outcomes, the benefits of the scientific, uh, the scientific process that are involved in this project, right? And so I would put those videos out. And what I found is I started getting tons of questions from viewers. And so I started making videos in direct answer to those questions. Things like, what do you need to major in? How much do you get paid in marine biology? What classes should you take? Um, you know, are all marine biologists all the white guys, right? Like these kinds of things. And so I ended up making a ton of videos, um, dozens of, of videos, uh, just again, sort of sharing my experience, my journey in, in getting involved in science as someone who, who had no background prior and in really taking the audience along for the ride. And so early on, um, I started to collect uh, survey data from viewers because I want to understand, like, is this actually doing something? Like, it's fun to do this, but this is not about fun. The, the research is fun. If all I cared about was fun, I would have no outreach component. I would just do research. Um, so what is this actually doing? So I started putting surveys out. And uh, one of the questions that I asked had to do with uh, stimulated interest in research. And what I found with 530 respondents that 95% uh, became interested in the scientific research being discussed in the video. Um, and I also asked about um, self-reported perceptions about science, scientists, careers in STEM. And I found, again, a majority um, across all respondents, um, they had improved perceptions of science, scientists, and careers in STEM um, as a result of observing uh, one or more of these videos. And this majority increased uh, when we subsetted female and minority viewers. So underrepresented groups in STEM seemed to um, appreciate these videos. Uh, these videos seem to resonate with these groups. Um, so this was really exciting for me. And I think it was validating. It was, okay, like we can actually share this other side of science that is unfortunately 
at least for me, was never, I never had access to this side. And I think that's, it's got to be true for so many kids, um, you know, or early career folks. And so I felt fairly confident at that point to um, close phase one. Phase one, can it work? The answer is yes. What's phase two? Well, phase two was to scale it up, make the whole thing bigger. That was always the intention. And so in 2019, I um, started to recruit heavily, actually, even prior to 2019. 2019 is when we really assembled. But um, by the start of the pandemic, we grew to a team of over 30 research scientists that span the natural sciences and engineering uh, and other and, and, and uh, various tech um, professions. And now the whole idea is like, I'm just one person, right? I, I have a story. And maybe there are some folks out there that could relate to my story and may see themselves in me and I can help validate their potential interests in this field. And that would be great. But I'm just one person that looks and acts a certain way that has a certain background. I'm very fortunate that I have lots of amazing scientist friends that all look and act differently that have their own paths to STEM. Many of them are from underrepresented groups. In fact, Sile's team is a majority BIPOC, majority female team of over 30 research scientists. And our whole thing is we are going to continue to share personal stories of how we got here, why we're here, um, what it's actually like to do this stuff. Like, what is it actually like? Um, and uh, and if, if you're inspired enough by what we share, we will provide the exact kind of mentoring that we provide to students in person that are fortunate enough to be at a flagship research university like CU Boulder and could visit my office and ask me questions. We broadcast those answers to the masses through YouTube videos. So we wanna make STEM career mentoring accessible to everybody. Um, and so the, the formalization of the uh, foci of SILE is to use storytelling to humanize scientists. We're not just talking heads, we're not unrelatable, privileged, rich people. We're all kinds of people. Everyone can be a scientist. And I'd argue everyone actually already is a scientist in the way that they ask questions of the world, collect information, and inform their decision making um, based on that information. That is the process of science. Professionals just do it professionally. Demystify the process of scientific discovery and what it offers both to individuals and to humankind. I think one of the most exciting things about my job is that I get to serve humankind. It's not just about me, which I find a lot of value in. And make personal connections to STEM possible for all. Another way to word that would be foster STEM identity development. Allow anybody, no matter what they look like, no matter their circumstance, to think of science as something they could pursue if they wanted to and give them the tools to do that. So if they want to be a professional scientist, we want to do everything we can to help them um, within the constraints of our uh, mass communication remote platform. Um, I'm just about out of time, so I'm just going to wrap up by leaving you with a message of hope. Uh, I truly believe we can do this. And what is this? This is empowering a diverse public to appreciate the utility that science is and to see themselves in the process of scientific discovery in some way. And that can be simply being a scientifically literate individual who recognizes the benefits that scientists offer us. That in and of itself would be a gigantic accomplishment if you're able to do that across traditionally uh, marginalized, traditionally forgotten and overlooked groups, because then you have a more empowered public. And within a democracy like we have, that means we can affect change that follows the best scientific guidance, which I would argue is our best way forward as a species. So we can do this, we should do this. I would argue that scientists, I know there's a bunch of scientists in this call. Uh, I think scientists traditionally, you know, we've done the ivory tower thing. We've, we've ha uh, had a lot of fun <laughs> and written, written really cool papers and shared them with our other scientists, uh, friends who are also having a lot of fun doing science. But I think it's probably true that many of us could agree that the time of doing science in a silo is long gone. And we in fact have to be keystone informants to, to borrow a term I introduced earlier. We need to be um, spreaders of the information that we take for granted, not just about our expertise, but importantly, our human experience with being 
scientific researchers and like what that's actually like. So people can relate to us and understand um, where we're coming from and why we're doing what we're doing. And I think if we do this in mass, I truly believe that we can not only, of course, galvanize the public to be informed and make decisions like voting that are in their best interests, but we might even inspire a lot of scientists that might not have been scientists. How many discoveries are we squandering by limiting how many people can become scientists and who exactly can become scientists in our country and globally? And I think if we can accomplish this in mass, I, I truly believe that despite how insurmountable these barriers sometimes seem, I think we can overcome them. I think we can bring the public and STEM together where they belong. And I think we can usher in the kind of future for the planet Earth that I think we all want to see. So I think I'm exactly out of time. If I, I thought I was supposed to have 10 minutes left, so hopefully I'm right about that. Um, so I'll just uh, end by saying uh, thanks to these funding agencies. I actually did end up becoming a National Geographic Explorer, so they pay for my research, um, which is which is kind of funny, a little bit of a, a twist at the end there. Um, and then of course the National Science Foundation, Google and TED. Um, and I, I will be happy to take questions. And if you don't have time, if we run out of time, feel free to email me. Thanks again. Well, all I can say is, wow, um, before we get to questions and comments, let's just show a little love. We're seeing some hands clapping signs show up. Um, however, yeah, the, very inspiring, very informative, and we are certainly grateful to have you part of our community. Um, we do have a couple of minutes to just hear about impressions from the workshop from our community members um, or any questions for Mike. So I'll pause and see if hands show up or perhaps you want to come off of mute. Kathy Noonan wrote in the chat, Mike, your work and passions are so inspiring. Thank you so much. That's really sweet. Thank you. I think we'll be reaching out to you about some other things. So <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the last time you're going to hear from us. Thank you so much. This is amazing. My pleasure, Kathy. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to add, Mike, I just cannot even believe how um, uh, just matter of fact and and just, just the way that you put into action what you think and what you believe, like immediately, it's just pretty inspiring. And um, I, I feel, I'm feeling really grateful that you're a part of this college. So thank you. Thanks, Bernadette. I really appreciate that. We're seeing, still getting lots of claps and hearts and high fives being sent your way. We do have a couple more minutes, so we'll just pause and see if hands come up or comments in the chat, or feel free to take yourself off of mute. I guess I do have a question for the students that are taking your class. Um, obviously, that's a significant amount of money to do the other parts. Are there scholarships for that? How do they? There are. There are. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, one of the things that I love about the opportunity to teach this class here, this has not been true in my other experiences, but um, students have a cost of attendance for the class. And so actually, um, over half of our enrollment is students on financial aid currently. We have um, the majority of students are either of that um, background where they, you know, um, have been financially disadvantaged would be one way to word it, uh, or their first generation. So we, it's and there's there's so much interest in this that it's it's really cool that we're drawing that diversity of applicants for the class. Mm -hmm. um, so they students that do uh, have a financial aid package can apply that directly to the course uh, fees. On top of that, there are various scholarships within CU's education abroad um, office that students can apply for. And SIL is actually going to start raising money for scholarships for this class. So um, we're going to try to kind of hit this from a bunch of different angles. Um, mm -hmm. I've been really pleased with the diversity of students I've been able to draw into these classes in the past. 
Um, but the truth is it can, it can be a challenge, right? It can be a challenge to do this, not just from a financial perspective, but if you have dependents, if you have other issues, um, you may not be able to leave for three weeks to the field, right? So we're really trying to be as mindful as we can to reduce or eliminate as many barriers to entry as possible. Thank you. Other questions, comments, or feedback? Well, as we'll monitor these items, I just want to remind everyone um, that there is monthly content updated on the Be Well website, including um, recordings of our previous Let's See You Well workshops and information about upcoming events. I'll put that in the chat now. Um, and unless there's anyone else wanting to ask a question or comment, I will leave this session with a deep bow of gratitude to Mike and his amazing work. Um, I am just blown away over here. So thank you so much for everything you offer our community and beyond. And I hope you all can join us for next month's session. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks so much, Erin. Thanks for everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing love in the chat. So make sure you take a look. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I hope to meet a lot of you folks. I'm new. So um, let's meet sometime. Be cool. Absolutely. All take right. Care, we'll guys. sign off for now. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>